Hi, I'm Laura Ford at the University of Tulsa, and I am recording this presentation on how we teach, which is about material and energy balances this year. This survey is done by the Education Division's Curriculum Committee, and I'm going to turn off my camera so that it doesn't show, uh, cover up the slides here. Okay, some of the results that we will be talking about during this presentation are that the Material and Energy Balances class covers chemical process design, but also formal problem solving strategies and numerical problem solving approaches. First, I want to thank my committee members, Janie Brennan, Jennifer Cole, Kevin Dom, Marnie Jamieson, Lucas Lonher, David Silverstein, Stephen Deal, Bruce Vaughn, and Christy Wheeler West. And they worked on putting together the survey questions and then analyzing them as well. I also want to thank the people who responded to our survey. In case you haven't responded to the survey, the link is up at the top. We've had, you know, depending upon the number of questions, 78 or 79 respondents, and the schools are listed here. If we have a number after it, that means that two different faculty members both responded to the survey. Regarding the type of system that the schools are on, four of them are on the quarter system and 74 are on the semester system. And 77%, 77 of the schools are ABET accredited and two are accredited by Engineers Canada. We asked to what students are the courses taught and the vast majority of the schools teach material and energy balances to first term sophomores. There are also some who cover the class anywhere from first term freshman through third term sophomore year. We were curious who was in the classes for material and energy balances, and half of the classes have only chemical engineers in them. The other common students are other engineering majors, primarily biomedical, engineering physics, mechanical, and environmental engineering, and biological engineering. We also have students from chemistry and physics and a scattering of other majors in the classes. For prerequisites, general chemistry is required by all of the classes. Then Calculus 1, Calculus 2 are often required, and Physics 1 are often required, is often required. In this diagram, we asked about the expectations for experience with software coming into the class. The blue bars represent that we don't expect them to have any experience. The red ones are novice experience. Green is that they are experienced. And purple is that they are proficient users of this type of software. So looking at all of the blue on the diagram, we don't expect very much software experience coming into the course. What we do expect some is word processing, spreadsheets, and presentation software. Now, we also have some schools that expect computerized algebra systems and a few other computer programming and some other things. But combining the red and the blue, we generally do not expect them to have much experience. Um, looking at the purple, the green, and the red together, we can see that we do expect them to have at least some experience with the word processing spreadsheets and presentation software. Of the schools that do expect some software experience, MATLAB is the computer algebra system that we expect by far. And then for programming languages, Python is the most common over VBA, C++, and Java. To do the computer work, most of the universities do provide computer labs. Those computer labs are maintained by the college, usually. We do not require the students to buy computers. So 61% of the 74 schools said that they do not require a computer to be purchased by the students. The computer labs that the universities do provide are primarily Windows computers. 
The majority of our schools do require only one course, and that course is usually three credit hours. So on the left-hand side, we have the number of courses required. 73% of the schools require only one course, and 25% require two courses. The quarter system schools are evenly split between requiring one course and two courses. 87 courses were described as far as the number of hours that they have, and nearly two thirds of those courses are three credit hours, and a quarter are four credit hours, and there are a, number, a substantial number that are only two credit hours. And I looked and the difference between having a first class and a second class, the second classes were not more frequently two credit hours or four credit hours as far as I could tell. For assessments, exams and individual homework are used at many, many of the universities. Pre-analysed quizzes are also common and participation in team homework are common. We asked in a bit more detail about the case studies. These were used by these were used by 28% of the total respondents. As far as why they use them, often because of it provides context and some real world practice. 55% of the case studies were used as in-class activities, either as discussions or examples or assignments, and then just over a third were used as out-of-class activities for projects or homework. We didn't have details on 25% of how the projects were used. One place that was mentioned as a source for projects was the repository at West Virginia University, and the link is down at the bottom of the page here. As expected, the American English, the American engineering system and British units are not used very commonly in the material and energy balance course. Most of the classes use over 75% SI units in their examples and work, and then another 43% use a mixture of both SI and American engineering system. This is a plot of the percent of assignments that are turned in that require a computer. The majority of the classes do not require a, a computer for most of the assignments. So 20% or fewer of the assignments are completed using a computer in over half of the classes. We asked about the textbook that is used in the courses and the Felder, Russo and Bullard textbook is used in 80% of the classes. Libratory is used in 9%. The other category was primarily thermodynamics textbooks. The Felder, Rousseau, and Bullard textbook was about 86% in the previous survey 10 years ago, so it has declined slightly in market share since then. This graph shows different topics in the textbook and whether they are covered as a lecture topic or an assignment topic in the course. So the percent of courses that say they used them as lectures, the blue top bars, or as assignments, the red bottom bars. So the vast majority of the textbook topics are covered in the classes all the way through energy balances on reactive systems, even in a series of classes. The computer-aided balance calculations and transient balances are the only two topics that are not covered in at least half of the classes. In group schools that do have two courses for the material and energy balances. The second course often emphasized the energy balance part of the material. We also asked about professional skills in the course. And so again, these are the top blue bars are the schools that cover, have, cover this topic as a lecture topic. And the bottom red bars are schools that cover this as an assignment topic. So over half of the universities cover formal problem solving strategies as part of the course. The courses are often broken into different sections and over half of those sections are 40 students or smaller. 
We asked for some details about projects and labs. And so these are for 36 responses, so a, only a smaller portion of the courses actually have a project or a lab. But of those projects or labs, sometimes doing a full development of the problem or just doing some calculations. Again, for some professional skills, what do we expect the material and energy balance course to teach in addition to just material and energy balances? So a very common response, as well as numerical approaches to solving equations. We asked faculty what they thought about the current textbooks available for the course. And in general, people were satisfied. So 25% of the people didn't respond at all, which we assumed meant that they thought was the textbooks were OK. 44% were satisfied and 31% unsatisfied. For the faculty who were unhappy with the textbook, the most common request was more examples outside of traditional chemical engineering. And so some suggested fields were environmental, consumer products, safety, biological, sustainability, and nuclear and energy. Some people wanted more transient balances, and some people thought the textbooks were too expensive. Next, we asked for ways to effectively teach the material and energy balances course. And the first category of responses were that ex explanations need to be practical, relatable, and tangible. Some ways that faculty could do this, use videos, visuals, or demonstrations. When discussing processes, use processes for familiar products, such as ketchup and toothpaste so the students can relate to them more easily. An example to use with Recycle is to talk about chocolate coating and how we have to recycle the chocolate in order to reduce waste. Some basic ideas for describing balances would be balancing a bank account, including interest and fees, or doing a balance of people entering and leaving a room or a building, including deaths and births. And then another example that is relatable is using Lego pieces as atoms to show the conservation of mass, that when there's a pile of Legos, they're still the same atoms as when we do a reaction with them and make them into something. And if we take that and make it into something else, the atoms are still conserved. Another aspect of teaching materials and energy balances effectively is reinforcing a systematic problem-solving approach. Another aspect of effectively teaching materials and energy balances is that we need to demonstrate a systematic problem-solving approach. We're teaching this to people who are learning how to do material and energy balances, so we shouldn't skip any steps along the way. We need to do a degree of freedom analysis and use a consistent approach to nomenclature and labeling. We need to keep track of the knowns and the founds as we go through the problem. We need to understand what we can work out from what we already know, and then practice it and practice it and practice it some more. We also asked about major challenges in teaching materials and energy balances, and one of the categories for this was course design. Just the amount of content that we need to teach in the class, which leads to the pacing as we go through the class and balancing the depth of coverage with the breadth of coverage. There are two potential solutions. One is everyday meetings. So making sure that we are meeting with the students every day of the week for either class or recitation or lab. And then another idea is having a concurrent thermodynamics course that does the energy balance part of the course. Another major challenge in course design was the class size. Also a major challenge in teaching materials and energy balances is the course content. And we divided this into two different categories based upon the responses, specific content for the course, and then problem solving techniques. Under the specific content, there were several things mentioned, degrees of freedom, equilibrium, transient systems, and energy balances. Under problem solving techniques, the getting the students to adapt to the problem solving methodology is a problem and then getting them to go beyond just doing plug and chug and memorization or searching for the right equation. It's a challenge to get them to understand the chemical engineering language and drawing flowcharts, and then also mathematical formulations of the problem statements, and they are challenged when they have multiple ways to solve a problem. Another category of my major challenges is the students themselves. And we broke this into academic preparation and student maturity. Under academic preparation, of course, there are disparate 
disparities in preparation of skills among the students. And then they also have weaknesses sometimes in math or chemistry or basic chemical engineering concepts and languages. Under student maturity, the a major problem is teaching them how to manage their time and out of class efforts and then teaching them about professional behavior. When asked about the most common technology for teaching material and energy balances, LearnKimmy.com was by far the most commonly mentioned. There were several others, software and simulation, Wiley Plus for the textbook, YouTube, Excel, Zybooks, and other websites as shown here. Faculty do have some things that they learned from our time teaching remotely that they will be carrying over to in-person teaching. Lecture recordings and pre-recorded content were the most common ones, as well as virtual office hours. Some faculty made changes to the way they evaluate the class, and that included oral exams and more quizzes. And then others changed yet the, the entire structure of the course. And so under the other category, some of the faculty created learning communities for the students and then also broke the class into concept modules to cover the material in a slightly different format. These are some categories that were not mentioned in earlier questions, and we broke these up into different areas as well. So first is structural approaches. Some people treat material and energy balances as two separate courses. The second one in this case has an in-depth reactive evaluations and includes technical writing. Another idea somewhat already mentioned before is having material and energy balances incorporated into the thermodynamics class, specifically doing reactive systems in thermo. The material and energy balance course can also be done in conjunction with a computational methods class. We mentioned modules a little bit earlier. One school has material and energy balances as a six credit hour course with a one credit lab. Another group focuses on things that maybe other schools do in a first year experience course, effective domains of growth mindset, self-efficacy, metacognition, and belongingness. And another group has elements of surprise in the class to try to keep the students on their toes. So they have curveballs with pop quizzes and off the cuff group activities. And the idea is that this is preparing them for thinking in later courses. Some classes have special content, so design of wastewater treatment systems or real world examples with a visit to a combustion facility. Another class takes a manufacturing process or product and threads it throughout the entire course to have a theme for the course. Some faculty make a great effort to learn and use all of the student names. Others provide time for guest speakers or you have YouTube Fridays, which may be chemical engineering or other engineers. One class has two gamified quizzes every two weeks. The first one focuses on basic skills, but the second one has more complex problems. These are unlimited attempts and give automatic feedback with incorrect answers so that the students can improve. Another class forces the students to interact with each other as much as possible so they can develop a sense of community in the class, hopefully to help them make it through the rest of the curriculum together. Another distinctive feature was grading methods. So one class minimized the high stakes exams by adding fl grading flexibility and then another one was providing real-time feedback, giving the students problems to work on in the class and then providing instructor solution, instructor solution afterwards, immediately afterwards, so the students can see what they were doing wrong on those example problems. Some other more general comments about teaching material and energy balances. One, it encouraged other faculty to build, build connections with students by holding office hours in the student lounge or the gathering area where the students are, so going to the students rather than having them come to us. Another faculty member focuses on identifying the governing equations and drawing sensible process flow diagrams. One faculty member divides the class time in half. Half of the time is class material, material and energy balances. The other half is for developing the problem-solving strategies. 
Another faculty member commented that the time required to teach unit conversions and dimensionality and process variables takes away from doing the material and energy balance course material in the only course that they have for this material. Another department has new faculty teach the material and energy balance course with an experienced faculty mentor the first time through. So on this page, I'm going to summarize some of the things that we found. The material and energy balance course is taught to primarily first term sophomores, primarily only chemical engineering students, usually in one course that is three credit hours. For prerequisites, we have general chemistry and calculus two, and we expect the students to be novices in most software maybe know the most about some basic office software for our presentations and spreadsheets and word processing. In the class, we assess them with exams and homework and announced quizzes and team homework. There are a few assignments that are required to be done on a computer. We are using the Felder, Rousseau, and Balut textbook, and we cover through reactive energy balances in the material. Generally, there are 40 or fewer students per section. If your school has not contributed to the survey yet, I have the survey link up here, and you can look for this video on my YouTube channel in case you want to refer other people to it. Thank you for coming.